As a businessman traveling through the Far East to study investment possibilities, I had included Indonesia in my itinerary. Shortly after my arrival, I met an Indonesian friend in the Ambassador restaurant in Jakarta. I've traveled a good deal, but Indonesia was new to me, and I like to see new places and meet new people. A new place, he said. Indonesia is many places. One country, yes, with its 90 million people, the sixth most populous country in the world. But it is a huge island chain. 3,000 miles from west to east, and with more than 3,000 islands. These are the spice islands that Columbus sought when he found America. Islands that are the natural home of clove, nutmeg, pepper, vanilla, cinnamon, and camphor. I was anxious to see the natural background of these many flowering islands, of which I had read so much, both in technical literature and in the fiction of Joseph Conrad and Somerset Moore. Now, for the first time, I had an opportunity to see the deserted beauty of white strands in the Java Sea. Hills and mountains, verdant by the ash of the volcanic turmoil which formed them. the ancient god of fire, grumbling in the mists of the great sand sea. Quiet rivers, centuries-old highways for the jungle dwellers, and arteries of modern commerce through the islands of Sumatra and Kalimantan. Here were the people, nameless crowds. I was impressed by the extreme beauty and delicacy characteristic of the Indonesians. Their rich cultural background remains, undestroyed, cared for. The great Buddhist era is fixed forever in their memories by this magnificent symbol at Borobudur. of religious significance, yet assimilated and accepted, a place for contemplation or for youth on holiday. Today, most Indonesians are Muslims, and many mosques stand now in the towns and cities an active religion practiced by an industrious people. Here in Java, an island only slightly larger than Portugal, there are 54 million people moving about, busy with their daily tasks. Yet this country whose economy was formerly based on agriculture is rapidly modernizing. With Indonesia's great natural wealth and their own skill and energy, these people will help their country to advance in economic progress. Theirs is an uphill task, for the country is short in investment capital but they're going ahead with an eight-year development program. Cities are busy, and the need for good communications is being met. Yet with these tasks facing Indonesia, I found little tension. There was time for pleasure, a place for you. from the smooth 
wide road out of Jakarta. Yet here, in this village of Chicopo Salata, I found a totally different environment. Near here was the capital of the old Sundanese kingdom, powerful from the 12th to the 16th centuries. And Sundanese is still the language among the older people. For many, this quiet life is preferable. Yet too often in many countries, the rural scene is also a mark of poverty. Not here. A simple life, yes, with such old customs as prefabricated walls of palm leaves. Yet a happy life with time for past things which live on as a part of the country's scene. Puppets still used to tell the story of the Hindu Ramayana. Bomba, son of Krishna, and Udel, the clown. The village economy is based on rice, the country's staple food. And for rice, there must be water. Quiet rice paddy fields ingeniously terraced by people whose skill in creating irrigation systems goes back 2,000 years. These same people will in the future willingly turn to the use of modern fertilizers and machinery in order to increase their agricultural production, thus decreasing imports and saving several million dollars yearly in foreign exchange. Here is production, too, of a different kind. 10,000 species of trees, half a million species of plants attract the botanists of the world to Indonesia's botanical gardens in Bogor, Java. Here, the first experimental oil palms were planted, the first rubber trees in the East Indies, the first quinine trees outside South America. All of these today form major agricultural enterprises in Indonesia. Two leaves and a bud. That is what each tea plucker has to fill her basket with. Even on the tea plantation, I was impressed by the calm patience of the Indonesian people. Good tea, one of Indonesia's large exports. day on the tea plantation. A thousand workers dressed for the occasion, a gay and happy scene. Economic stability for the villagers. In this age of uniformity, I was pleased to find that the national dress is still very popular. The batik makers still use their traditional arts, blanking out complicated patterns with lines of hot wax, dyeing the cloth, re-waxing and dying again and again until the pattern is complete. Each design is peculiar to area, one for West Java, and this made only for the fishing villages of Central Java. The seas between and around these many islands abound in fish. Although modern power-driven fishing boats are rare, I found that a start is being made in developing a large-scale Indonesian fishing industry with a new tuna canning factory on Bali, the island just east of Java, and a fish cannery in Ambon.
A home is happy with a singing bird. For me, this old saying means Eastern Java. For here there are few houses without their birds. The Javanese are logical people. They say that the bird lives in a tree, so how happy it will be high up. And because of this, we will be happy too. I did not want to leave the villages and the people, but I had not yet come to the most important part of my mission. I had to find out more about the possibilities of foreign investment in this country. Investments which could be mutually profitable to the investors and to Indonesia. I called on an Indonesian businessman in Surabaya. I told him what I had already seen, the countryside and some of the great agricultural industries, tea, coffee, copra, rice and palm oil. He wanted me to see more, the vast forest areas of Kalimantan or Borneo, Celebes, and the jungles of Sumatra. From the air, he said, I could see the Asahan Falls, scheduled to provide badly needed hydroelectric power for bauxite smelting and possibly for fertilizer production. Again, away on the north tip of Sumatra, paper mills were to be built. I told him how interested I was in the investment possibilities in Indonesia for either foreign capital or in joint foreign Indonesian enterprises. It is our desire also, he told me. Yes, the new buildings were rising, for Indonesia must build to house its new and modern plants for industry, to house its office staff must progress swiftly in this new era of industrialization. An Indonesian cement plant in East Java, one of the keys to the building program. New buildings to house new and modern plant for industry. Textile. Opened in 1958 with an output of 50,000 meters a day, this plant still only satisfied 15% of Indonesian requirements. In this case, all the shareholders are Indonesian. There is an obvious opportunity for further investment in the textile industry. The processing of Indonesian-grown tobacco is another industry which must be developed still further. Latex from the rubber trees. From these small dribbles, Indonesia can produce over 30% of the world's supply of rubber. There are factories for the fabrication of rubber into tires, tubes, shoes, and mattresses. But more are needed. The growing of sugarcane is one of Indonesia's most important agricultural industries. Yet alone, this is not enough. Sugar, like most natural resources, attains its true value only when developed economically and brought to the world markets. The construction and use of modern plants such as this show the efforts of the Republic to develop its abundant resources. Here, from the input of 3,000 tons of cane a day during the peak period, about 3,000 bags of sugar, each 200 pounds, leave the plant daily. In this factory alone, including the plantation, 6,000 workers are employed. My friend was a well-informed and interesting man. He told me something of the mineral resources, copper, manganese, lead, zinc, bauxite, nickel, tin, and gold. courteous and helpful. Go and see more, he told me. So 
So I took a walk around the marketplaces and saw clearly that what my friend had told me was true. The mining of minerals is not enough. Bauxite, the basic ore for aluminum, is mined in Indonesia in large quantities. But it is sent abroad to be smelted and fabricated into the aluminum utensils used by the Indonesian housewife. Clearly a need for investment in electric power generation and metal processing in these islands. There are other industrial advances. This modern factory makes toothpaste, which no longer has to be imported. Indonesia is now self-sufficient in the manufacture of soap, margarine, and cooking oil all manufactured in modern plants such as this from the country's ample supply of coconut. This new factory, an Australian investment, manufactures aspirin. It is efficient and well run. Yet imports of other pharmaceutical supplies still cost Indonesia the equivalent of more than $12 million in foreign exchange a year. A great deal of this could be saved if more investment in the pharmaceutical industry took place locally. I moved on, traveling all the ways I could so that I could get the feel of the country. From Kamayaran, the international airport of Jakarta, I headed west, across the end of Sumatra to the island of Bangka. Here from the Java Sea, vast quantities of tin ore are dredged by some of the world's largest floating dredgers. Sample boring is done continually, a simple device but effective. Tin ore from the soft seabed, once a part of the large deposits on the island. From this open pit mining, it is estimated that over a million tons of tin have been mined since the start of the 18th century. And today, the industry of Banka Island rates only second to the great tin producing areas of Malaya. Yet, as I found in the case of bauxite mining, the Indonesian tin concentrates have to be sent abroad for smelting, and tin plate is often scarce in the Republic. The tin island of Banka, mentioned in the stories of Sinbad the sailor, has produced tin for at least 1,000 years. Throughout this period, too, it has also grown pepper on these vines that cover much of the island. From here, in 1603, the first cargo of over a million pounds of pepper was shipped to the Thames docks in London. Then, as now, Indonesia has consistently been the world's chief supplier of pepper. I left the tin and spice island of Banka and flew on over the wild Sumatran jungles. Lake Toba and the falls of Asahan. In Sumatra, and the great rainforests of Kalimantan and Celebes are the trees. Their products, timber, plywood, resin, tannic acid, and paper are all important assets. 
Yet Indonesia must import newsprint and wallboard through lack of capital investment. This modern sawmill, set near the banks of the Siak River in Sumatra, was established by private Indonesian capital, which was assisted by a French loan. It has been operating since 1957, with a capacity of 40 cubic meters of sawn timber for each eight-hour working shift. The dark red Maranti, a type of mahogany, makes valuable lumber. It is produced on a small scale, but efficiently. Deep in this wild jungle country have been found the oil fields of Indonesia. The oil pioneers had to explore countries such as this geologically, then drill in likely looking areas to find out whether oil was there. Even after oil was found, the task which faced them was formidable. Roads to be built, housing, offices, pipelines. And the greatest enemy which stood before these oil men was the jungle. and machines attacked the jungle, clearing it, working around swamps. Whole new oil towns were built, brought into existence as a part of one of Indonesia's major revenue producing industries, oil which competes with rubber as Indonesia's greatest money-earning export. Foreign skill, equipment and money have created this great industry in which local people and domestic money is now playing an increasing part. Today, the discomfort of pioneering is replaced in the established oil camps by a normal life. Americans, Indonesians, Australians, and British. Civilization created by oil men where so recently only monkeys howled and tigers roamed. But the production of oil does not allow too much play and relaxation. Constant vigilance and maintenance is essential if oil is to flow towards its markets. During the fruitful years of development, thousands of Indonesian employees have readily adapted themselves to the new skills required in oil field operations. Today, over 90% of oil employees are Indonesian. One unforeseen effect of this pioneering was the appearance of these tribes of wild hunters from the almost impenetrable jungle. They have come to build their shelters near the new roads. They feel more secure. Even they benefit from the oil industry of their own country. Oil 
pipelines and communications. They follow, and the new roads are being driven through the swamps and the steaming forests of Sumatra towards the sea terminal. I returned to Jakarta to bid goodbye to my Indonesian friend and to tell him of all I had learned. I had collected a wealth of data on this newly independent and rapidly developing country. A land rich in diverse natural resources. A land where if sufficient capital were invested, many basic and secondary industries could be developed. Then I recall seeing a young woman climbing the ancient sun-worn steps of Borobudur. And to me it was symbolic of the successful grafting of modern industrialization on the age-old cultural background still strongly prevailing in the lives of the Indonesian people. My journey lay westward toward the business centers of the great cities. But I knew that I should return to these green islands with their golden future. <laughs>